Good Friday morning. Today we're going to begin the letter to the Philippians. That's interesting, St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. If I could tell, just to, for those of St. Tim's and St. Mark's, maybe from St. Yeah, you know, from both, this is a little bit of a, just a sweet remembrance and kind of a laugh, okay? Joke. I remember when I, oh, who knows how many years ago, 40, 50 years ago, one of the readers, and it was Jim Friedman, I remember that, and he was he was a, a member of St. Tim's Parish, and he was one of the readers, okay? And I remember, God, I think it's got to be when I was first came here 50 years ago, 45 years ago. Anyway, he was, he was and I think it might have been this day he was reading this text, so it was St. Paul's letter to the Filipinos instead of the Philippians. And I can't get that out of my head. Instead of St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, it's St. Paul's letter to the Filipinos. I remember that with great affection for Jim, for Jim and his family. <laughs> the letter to the Filipinos. Well, this isn't to the Filipinos, it's to the Philippians. It's a powerful letter. It's a similar to the to what was just read in Ephesians. I believe this letter was written before, actually, the letter to the to the Ephesians. I think it's considerably before. But when you read it, you see his deep love, his deep love for his people and his encouragement. I, I see that as the gospel is to encourage each other to, to, to render the gospel a gospel of love. Not schmaltz, real love, a love that creates a community, not of fear and conformity, but of intimacy, that we're together. Watch what he says. This, this is his introduction. This is chapter 1, 1 through 11. And so this is his opening line to the people, of the, to the Philippians. Paul and Timothy, slave of Christ Jesus, to all the holy ones in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful way to start. I'm wishing you grace and peace. Isn't that neat? I give thanks to my God at every, at every remembrance of you. See, I remember you with such affection, with thanksgiving, see? Praying always with joy and my every prayer for all of you because of your partnership for the gospel from the first day until now that we are members of the same gospel, so your partnership. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right, and I should think this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart. What a wonderful line. You who are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, those who are suffering with me and who are out there proclaiming the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may increase ever more and more in knowledge and every kind of perception to discern what is of value, so that you may be sure and blameless for the day of Christ. You may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Isn't that neat? See? Let me just share this with you. See, he wishes them the fullness of life. You see, that your love may increase, okay, in knowledge and every kind of perception to discern what is of value so it may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. See, for what purpose? for the glory and praise of God. Not to get, save your soul, but the praise and glory of God. All right, somebody asked me very recently, actually, I think it was actually today, about the council, the Second Vatican Council. And what is the dominant theme that I, that I saw the difference between the two? And, and is this, that the language of St. Paul, you would have rarely heard in the pre-council, conciliar church. I grew up in it, and I entered the order, as I mentioned, I entered the order in the pre-Vatican II church. And it was a church of prescriptive rules. It was a church of rules. The canon lawyers dominated the, the, the moral theology of the church. They dominated, so it was a canonical approach to morality. It had its purpose. It had its purpose. It certainly gave us a code of ethics that was highly strict, very strict, very narrowly defined, very legal. And in that sense, for people who are fundamentally ignorant, being blunt, okay, uneducated in that sense, that's stupid, uneducated. And I would say, for our, in this sense, an uneducated church, it served its purpose. It provided a morality. The problem was the church 
we grew up. Generation after generation grew up. We were not merely ignorant and uneducated people. We were, in some ways, at least as well educated as the clergy, if not more, which means we were capable of greater reflection. Humpty Dumpty was not going to stay on the wall. He was going to fall off the wall. In other words, the canonical approach was only going to take us so far, and it ceased taking us. It took the council to shatter that image, and what it presented was the Pauline view of the church. It gave us a view of Christ and the, the gift of the Spirit in living the life of the faith. It's much less strict, and it is far less clearly defined, but it has the energy of Christ in a way that the early church didn't. The early church was a church of prescriptive fear. We were terrified by all the rules and all the legislation. We, and when the guy said we were, we were the Pharisees all over again, it worked as long as we were, excuse my expression, but a peasant church, but we're not peasants. We're not peasants. And that kind of legalistic morality is not gonna hold up under reflection. And it didn't. It didn't. You can terrorize people just so long with the fear of hell. Finally, one day you're going to wake up and smell the coffee and say, this doesn't make sense. In my, in my homily this morning at church, it was again, Christ was attacking the Pharisees for their Pharisaism. It's not that they were wrong, but how could, they, how could anybody in their right mind see some of the evils that were, some of the prescriptions that, that were considered so evil compared to what are truly evil? I mean, when I think of the 20th century, I know I beat this thing to death, but what a perspective you get on life. How could you worry, how could you take seriously some of the prescriptions of the pre-Vatican II church? When I think about this, and it's the penalty of hell, and it's because the lawyers were running the church, the canon lawyers. So we had mortal sins and venial sins. We degrees of this and degrees of that, and what was a mortal sin, what was it? It would help you go to confession. But we put on the same plan, you're gonna to go to hell forever, if you ate meat on Friday. Yeah. After the Holocaust, that's what evil looks like. Eating meat on Friday is not the same thing. So whether you were a part of that horror, the horror of the Holocaust, or you just happened to eat a hamburger, you ended up in the same, you say, in hell. How can that ever be rational? How can anybody take that seriously? And we did. We did. We took it that seriously. I remember my father. God, he could be good. I told you that already. I mean, I'm sure I did. Yeah, it was just, it created scruples, but it didn't create a moral wisdom. The Second Vatican Council came to give us a moral vision, a wisdom of the world, a wisdom of, of, a, of a Christian world. And we're borrowing deeply from St. Paul in the scriptures. We were, we moved from law to morality, and a morality infused by the gospel, not by canon law. I know I attack canon law a lot, as necessary as it is, and it's absolutely necessary for the structure of the church and its functioning, but it isn't the moral order. It isn't even close. It's not even close. It's Pharisaism when it takes over the moral order. In fact, it makes the Pharisees look like pikers. It's absurd. The gospel is a gospel of freedom and love. It calls us to the highest form of human behavior, human dignity, but not out of servility, but out of the freedom of love. It calls us to be Christ-like, not pharisaically innocent. We're not called to innocence. We're called to the bravery and the courage and self-sacrifice of love to give and give and change the world through the intimacy and power of love itself. Not schmaltz, it's heroic. There was nothing heroic about being obedient to a bunch of canon laws. No way. This is, we are called in the post-Vatican II church to change the world, to evangelize the world through the gospel of love, not servility and fear.